it's just a shame, you know, we're not going to see her grow up, get married, graduate, have a family, any of those things. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with at least two new videos every single week. Please do join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Kristen. Kristen Denise Smart was born on February the 20th, 1977 in Augsburg, West Germany to Stan and Denise Smart. Denise worked as a teacher on an American army base stationed in Germany. Kristen had one brother and one sister. Her parents relocated to Stockton, California when she was a young child. Kristen went on to graduate from Stockton's Lincoln High School in 1995. She also worked as a lifeguard and camp counselor in Hawaii. Kristen was a freshman at California Polytechnic State University, popularly known as Cal Poly, in San Luis Obispo in 1996. On May the 25th, 1996, just a couple of days before Memorial Day, Kristen attended a birthday party at an off-campus fraternity house. She did not know anyone there, but thought it would be a fun adventure. Although her friends did not attend the party, they dropped her off there. Little did they know, this would be the final time that they would see Kristen. Kristen. She left the party at around 2am. Two other students who left the party, Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis, discovered Kristen passed out in a neighbour's yard. They assumed that she was drunk or drugged. While they were assisting Kristen, another student from the party, Paul Flores, whom she had met earlier that night, volunteered to assist the group and then all three of them would drop Kristen off at her dorm. On this journey back to Kristen's dorm, Tim Davis, who lived off campus and had driven to the party, was the first to leave the group. Next, Cheryl Anderson, who lived in another dorm, also left the group. Paul and Kristen were then left alone. Paul lived the closest to Kristen's dorm, so at the time, this made sense. Paul allegedly informed Kristen's friends that he took her back to the Muir residence, which was her dormitory. But Kristen was never heard from again. Kristen's roommate became concerned when she did not return home to her dorm on the morning of May the 25th. At this time, she alerted campus police. However, campus police did very little with this information. Campus police initially assumed she simply left on vacation without informing anybody. Most students tend to do this throughout the holidays, and because the long Memorial Day weekend was approaching, this explanation added up. Because of this, Kristen was not officially accepted as a missing person until May the 28th, despite her family regularly contacting the police and saying that she was missing. There was further evidence in the room that Kristen never returned. Her clothing, her belongings, her medicine and her identification were all still in the room where she always kept them. When authorities questioned Paul about Kristen's location, Paul stated that he did not walk her all the way back. Instead, they parted ways and he walked back to his own dorm. He said that he last saw Kristen on Grand Avenue shortly after Cheryl Anderson departed. Paul Flores was seen later in the day on May the 25th with a black eye, according to reports. He told the police that he was playing basketball when the ball hit him in the eye. But Paul arrived at the game with the bruise, according to his friends who were playing basketball with him. Paul later changed his story, claiming that he injured his eye whilst working on a truck at his father's house. Because I didn't think it would matter. How do we know that everything that you've told us so far is really the truth? How do we know now that you lied for well, 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 that wasn't important though. Sure it is. That's important. He then also allegedly informed another acquaintance that he had no idea how he got the black eye and that he simply woke up with it. Paul Flores dropped out of Cal Poly shortly after Kristen went missing. His grades were dropping, he was on the verge of failing university and he had been caught drunk driving and driving without a license. Police searched Paul's dorm room with cadaver dogs but no evidence was uncovered. There were banners and billboards everywhere in town, offering rewards for anyone with information about Kristen, as well as a link to the FBI website. Groups of volunteers scoured the area for any signs of where she may be. 
Others used ground-penetrating radar gear. Nobody knew if she was still alive or if she was buried in the ground. Even though Paul Flores was never actually convicted of the crime at this time, Kristin's family launched a $40 million wrongful death claim against him in 1997. In a November 1997 deposition, On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment. We are going off record now at 11 um, Paul refused to answer any questions and invoked the Fifth Amendment. After six years of no real developments in the case, Kristen was declared legally dead on May the 25th, 2002, the sixth anniversary of her disappearance. In 2003, Kristen Smart's case was linked to Lacey Peterson, who went missing on Christmas Eve in 2002. She was found deceased and Scott Peterson was found guilty of taking her life in 2003. Many people made the connection because when Kristen went missing, she was a freshman at Cal Poly and Lacey and Scott Peterson were seniors. Scott Peterson, however, denied any involvement in Kristen's case and he was subsequently cleared. In June 1996, shortly after Kristin went missing, an earring that many felt belonged to Kristin was found at a property owned by Paul Flores' mother. The people that found the earring were Joe and Mary Ann Lassiter. When they found it, it had a smeared fingerprint in what appeared to be dry blood. The couple gave the earring to two detectives from the sheriff's office. Mary Ann saw one detective hold up the earring and take a picture for evidence. However, the earring was never officially marked as evidence by authorities. The item was eventually lost. Do you uh, have any information as to where Kristen Smart's body is located? Of course not. Does your husband have any information as to where Kristen Smart's body is located? No. Does your son have any information as to where Kristen Smart's body is located? Nope. Has your son ever told you that he did not kill Kristen Smart? We never asked that question. We just, do you know anything about it? He says no. From 2011 to 2020, the Sheriff's Office and forensic specialists said they carried out 18 search warrants, that they submitted 37 items for DNA testing, recovered from 140 new pieces of evidence. They also conducted nearly 100 interviews. On September the 6th, 2016, the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office reported that they were investigating a fresh lead in the case. Cadaver dogs were brought in and searched the area for four days. They discovered objects on a hillside near Kristen's dorm. The items are being analysed to see whether they are connected to the case, which could take days, weeks or months. No further information on the items was ever given. Chris Lambert, a singer-songwriter, launched a 10-part podcast series on the events of Kristen's disappearance on September 30th, 2019. He compiled information and described in detail what happened 23 years ago. The podcast became a huge success with over 12 million downloads. This meant that the public's interest in the case grew, putting pressure on authorities to continue their investigation. This new interest meant that in January of 2020, the billboard asked for information that had been up since 1997 was replaced with a new one. Paul Flores' two trucks were taken into evidence on January the 29th, 2020, according to the San Luis Obispo Police Department. On February the 5th, 2020, search warrants were issued for particular items of evidence at four distinct sites. Two in San Luis Obispo, one in Washington State, and the other at Paul Flores' residence in Los Angeles County. So I became sheriff in 2011 and did a complete and requested a complete review of all the physical evidence that had ever been taken in the missing person case. In February of 2020, detectives served search warrants at the home of Paul Flores, as well as his sister, mother, and father. On April 22, 2020, it was announced that the items discovered during the search of Paul Flores' residence had been successfully recovered. They discovered date 
drugs and home videos of Paul Flores. On these videos, he was performing unconsensual intimate acts on young women. It was discovered that more than a dozen allegations of sexual assault against Paul Flores dated back to the late 90s. In these allegations, four women said that Paul met them in a bar, drugged them and then assaulted them. Some of those women, who did not want their real names used, told Lambert about their encounters with him. So I walk him up to his sister's apartment, and all of a sudden he just like picked me up, carried me inside, turned around, he shut the apartment door, and locked it. So I said, you better turn some lights on right now and let me out, or I'm going to scream. So eventually he unlocked you know, the apartment door, and, and I left. Lambert also interviewed a woman who dated Flores, until she says he became physically and verbally abusive. And he had like a butter knife and he like held it to my neck and I was screaming and my roommate actually kicked down the door to make him stop. On February the 11th, 2021, Paul Flores was arrested. Arrested on suspicion of being a felon in possession of a firearm, which is a felony offence in California. Cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar were utilised in March 2021 to explore the ranch owned by Ruben Flores. Ruben being the father of Paul. On April 13th, 2021, Paul was once again arrested at his residence in Los Angeles, this time charged with murder. Father Ruben was also arrested and charged with an accessory the same day. Authorities believe that Paul took Kristin's life during an attempt to assault her, just like the attacks that he carried out on the four other women. Police also believe that Ruben assisted his son in concealing the body after she passed. Authorities believe that Kristin's body was buried at Ruben's ranch until recently, at which point the remains were relocated. When they dug up Ruben's house, they discovered a piece of disturbed soil beneath the deck, indicating a shallow grave. At that location, the cadaver dogs began to exhibit small behavioural changes. The dirt contained traces of blood, but DNA could not be extracted from it. They also discovered fibres of various colours in the earth. These colours matched the clothing that Kristen was last seen in. A man that rented a room at Reuben's house for 10 years alleged that when Reuben mentioned Kristen to him, he referred to her as a dirty slut. According to authorities, there was a leak in Reuben's kitchen in 2014 and he refused a plumber to go beneath the deck to repair it. The trial was postponed several times before being moved to Monterey County to be heard by Judge Jennifer O'Keefe. Over 1,500 jury members were summoned and jury selection began on June the 13th with the trial's opening arguments beginning on July the 18th. After hearing all evidence, Paul Flores was found guilty of first-degree murder on October the 18th, 2022. And Paul Flores is looking at a possible life sentence. The San Luis Obispo Sheriff said that a popular podcast about Kristen's disappearance was crucial in bringing worldwide attention to this case and key witnesses. David? A podcast yet again. Mona Kosar Abdi tonight. Mona, thank. His father, Ruben, was found not guilty of accessory to murder. <laughs> not relieved. There was a, a lot of uh, made up things and th a lot of stories there and they and, and just uh, too much made up stuff. That's all I can say. That's for the family, the victim's family? Yeah, I, I feel bad for them because they didn't get no answers about what happened to their daughter. And we don't know what happened to their daughter. So, and I, like I say, I feel sorry for her. If Ruben had been convicted, he would have only served a maximum of three years in jail. Paul Flores now faces a sentence of 25 years to life in prison. California state legislators and Governor Pete Wilson signed the Kristen Smart Campus Security Act on August the 19th, 1998. The law, which went into effect on January the 1st, 1999, mandates all public colleges and universities to have their security services negotiate agreements with local police departments about reporting situations involving or possibly involving violence against students, including missing students. It is difficult to say whether this case has truly ended. Whilst the individual responsible will most likely spend the rest of his life in prison, Kristin's body has never been found and her parents have never been able to give her the proper funeral that she deserves. Do you think the punishment here fits the crime? Has justice been served? Let me know down in the comments. Make sure you hit like on this video to boost the signal of this case, which in my eyes is not yet over.
Join the Dark Case family by subscribing for at least two new videos every single week. Thank you to my patrons for helping the channel continue in its work. Karen Jones, James Harrington, El Palmeri, Adi Alexander, David James, Jason Grout and Shane Woodward. Please be safe and I'll see you soon.